Houdini 21 has also brought us the largest number of machine learning based tools and workflows in a Houdini release to date. And they are very different to the typical be shoehorned a chatbot in a product without asking you approach that we've seen with tons of other software lately. So we should take a look at it. One thing up front first, this will be just an overview, a show and tell style video. I think any one of those new features should get its own 20 minute tutorial in the near future. In this video, I just want to show you what's new and the quickest way to get to those exciting demos side effects showed in their launch presentation. So this is my scene file. You can also download it in the scene file download link and you can just follow along and you can also use the timestamps down below on YouTube to jump to the part that's most interesting to you. But these are my talking points for today. And let's start with what I find most exciting. Let's start with volume uprising. So for volume uprising, we first of all need some kind of simulation. And for this, we should use a pyro simulation. And since this is Houdini 21, why not use the pyro built into Copernicus? Because without the top overhead, this one is actually quite fast and fun to use. I haven't done everything special in here. Basically, I just wrote down a corp net. I searched for pyro configure and use the billowy smoke preset. I chose the end of the pyro resolver in here. It has an output. And on the corp net, I unchecked single output to get all my different fields that I need for pyro for rendering. And then I'm also just making my smoke a little more visible. And this is the end result. And as you can see, this is really nice and fast. So to uprest my pyro simulation, I need the right node for that. And I find this under uprest and it's the ML volume uprest node in here. This node is currently complaining because we haven't specified the right model up here. This is typically something that you would train yourself using some pre-built workflows from SideFX. However, with the Houdini version, we also get two pre-trained models that we can use. And we can find them under SHFS folder in here, which is for shade data between Houdini versions. And inside the Houdini folder, inside nodes, inside SOP, inside ML volume uprest and ML and billowy smoke, we find those two models, which are pre-built for this billowy smoke setup in here and also are already built into the shelf tool up here. However, I found them useful for quite a lot of pyro simulations in the end, or quite a range. For example, the dry eye smoke from the teaser image was also upscaled using this model. Let's load the two times upscale model in here. We also have a three times upscale model and set accept. And after a bit of waiting, we now have a result that is, well, upscaled from our original and does look quite convincing. Now we should still set some things up on this node right here. We should first of all select the right volume that we want to uprest. And in our case, that's pretty much always density. And we should at least scale up and resample those other fields as well. So temperature and velocity so that we don't get rendering artifacts. And this is why this checkbox right here is there. And now we have a little control to control the styling of our pressing. Again, this is a machine learning model that you're supposed to train yourself. So we don't have a ton of options in here. But what I found quite useful is to play with the pre-sharpen and post-sharpen. And in this case, I just upped the number of passes on the pre-sharpen up to five. And I like this result a bit more. And one final thing that you can also do using this new workflow is you can actually stack those nodes. So if you want a four times uprising, just stack two two times uprising nodes. And these models are perfectly happy to work with this data. Let's do just that. Let's stack two of them together. And after some waiting, we have a result that definitely looks a lot nicer, a lot more high risk than what we were starting out with. So finally, to quickly talk about the pros and cons of this new system on the pros, it's slightly faster to get a high res result compared to just upping the resolution of your pyrosim. However, this is not the main advantage of this new system. The main advantage is that this does not change the larger shapes of your pyro simulation. So you can spend just a lot more time in a lower sim, a sim that is fast and tweak this to your liking and then use the upper node just simply as a last filter for final quality. And also, since this in the background, both for training and also for inference, is using a type-based approach, so it's working just on chunks of your power simulation, not the entire thing. This means that bigger sims don't need more VRAM. So at least according to side effects, eight gigabytes of VRAM should be enough for pretty much all the training and all the inference that you're ever going to do with the system. And also this means that one model can fit a variety of sims. 
So for example, this Billowy smoke model is also perfectly happy to work on a dry ice model as well. And also for training, usually one high-risk simulation with just a couple of hundred of frames is enough to get the training done and getting a usable model. So this is totally doable on a single machine. You don't need a supercomputer for all of this. On the con side, well, training still takes time. You still have to put in a couple of hours to get a working model. And as you've seen, you get less control over the fine details and you have to decide how much those cons will outweigh the pros for you. Let's jump to the next topic and I quickly want to use this example that we had right here to talk about the general strategy of side effects of this whole thing. So first of all, the strategy of side effects here is still bring your own data and train your own model. So you're going to use Houdini to automatically create your training data and then you get to use the workflows from side effects to train your own model and then you're going to use this one. However, with this release, as you've seen, we also do have some pre-trained models by side effects and as far as I can see, these are trained using the exact same systems that you're going to use in the end. And also on the technical side, way down in the background, we still have the workflow of using PyTorch to train our neural nets. And exporting this as an Onyx file, the Onyx file that we, for example, loaded into our Upres node just now, and then using this in some Onyx inference of somewhere in our setup. This is how we used to do it in the last release. The big difference now is that pretty much everything of it is now wrapped in very simple UI and very nice and pretty nodes to use. So you don't have to interact with Python at all anymore. And also, as we're soon going to see, some training actually completely got rid of Python and there are no ways to do all your training just using SOPs, which is also hugely exciting. But we're going to get to that later. Let's talk about another new neural network feature, a machine learning feature, which is the neural point surface node. And this is just there to turn a point cloud like this generated from Pighead into an actual mesh that we can render. And for this, we can either use the neural point surface node, but this is also integrated into the NPM surface node and the particle fluid surface node. And basically, as soon as we wire this into a point cloud and we set the display flag, we now have this actually meshed into a, in this case, VDB that we can now turn into a mesh. So again, since this is a machine learning model, we don't have a ton of parameters in here. The main thing that we're going to set in here is the neural model. And you're going to select those just based on the shapes that you want to generate. So if you have a geometry like this, where you have some sharp areas and then also some smooth areas, you're probably best off using the balanced model. However, if your geometry is just smooth, then the smooth model is obviously better. And if you're dealing with liquids or grains, then use either one of these models right here. And of course, you can also train a custom model and there's already a file on the content library that you can use to do just that and then use this one if you need it. However, these models right here work quite nicely for me. The only thing that you kind of have to look out for on this node is I have this little exclamation point in here. And this currently tells me that I have currently some issue with my CUDA installation, probably something that will get fixed in a future Houdini version. But for now, this is running on the CPU. And this basically means that I don't really get any speed up compared to your typical version, but still I should get, in theory, a nicer result in the end. And also as a simple explainer on how all of this works, I just stole these two images in here from the documentation because I think they are working quite well. What we did in the traditional workflow, just took a point cloud and put STF spheres on every point. And then we used a ton of STF filtering, so smoothing and dilating and eroding to get to the final result. The neural workflow is a bit different, but also somewhat similar. We are still starting out with a point cloud, but in this case, we are not turning them into an SDF volume. We're turning them into a fog volume, so density values. And then we have a neural net in the middle that is able to take these density values and convert them to sine distance field values. And this is an output in the end. And again, doing this on your graphics card usually should result in quite a speed up. And also you should be able to get better results using less points. Now, the next feature that we should talk about is something that was quite a fun demo in the Houdini launch presentation, and this is the Neural Terrain Paint setup, which is a very, very old demo. I think this was first shown in some release back in the 2010s, but now we finally have a node. Well, we sort of have a node to do that. It's a little bit of work to get it in there, but I first of all want to show you the result. 
we can start out with a height field in here and we can drop down a neural terrain paint node, wire this in, then on this node select a model, in this case let's maybe choose this one, metamorphic, and then I can jump into my handles tool, I can set my brush and let's make this bigger and stronger, maybe something like this, and I can simply draw a shape and then the neural network in the background does all the noise and erosion automatically for me. So I can get very quickly a nice looking result in the end. Or you can use this simply as a sort of new erosion node, a fast erosion node. So I have this little demo right here where I start up the fight field, add some small noise to it, then also some larger noise in the shape of a symbol that you should be familiar with, just also animated and running this through the neural terrain paint Again, we get quite a plausible looking output and we get quite a fast update. And also we don't get a ton of flicker, but still a bit of flicker. So this can be used for all sorts of nice little experiments. Hey, editing Chris here. Two things that I forgot to mention at this point. First of all, while this is working quite well here in this demo, while testing it, I found that from all of the machine learning tools, this is probably still the least stable or the least generally useful because right now, currently this still sort of works in a very narrow band of parameters where the result in the end really looks nice. So for example, with this little demo right here that I'm currently showing, if I jump into my first side field noise and start increasing the element size, or not the element size, sorry, the amplitude, as you can see, this is very quickly degrading into something that is definitely not looking like the thing that I want to achieve in the end. And this is, for all the results, I've gotten still a fairly natural and beautiful looking result. I had a lot worse also playing with this tool. So maybe don't base your entire work for your entire pipeline around this tool. See it more of like an alpha tool, which is probably also the reason the install process is as complicated as you're going to see in a bit. But still, I think it's quite a fun thing to play around with. And also, what I should also say is that with this new tool, there is also a training workflow. And if you dive deep enough into that training workflow, you find out that this is all built on this new top node, this ML train style transfer top node, which I think is maybe the most exciting thing about this, being able to just train my own style transfer models directly from Houdini. This is definitely something for a future video. But this is all I wanted to tell you here and back to the original video now. Now, to actually get this node into Houdini is not quite as straightforward. First of all, this is only available for some reason in the content library. So you have to go into the content library, search for Neural Terrain Paint and download this file right here. And this file is one Houdini scene file with a bunch of HDAs that sort of walks you through this whole setup. However, if you want to have this as a node inside of Houdini, what I did is I just took the two HDAs that ship with the scene file and just imported them into my documents, into my Houdini 21 folder and inside the OTLs folder in there. So they get loaded up once Houdini starts. And once you have done so, you also have to download presets, so pre-trained models. And these are these three right here, which should automatically download to the right location, at least in theory. However, in my case, they did not do that. They downloaded for some reason to see Houdini and then this path right here. So to fix this, what I ended up doing is in here, just copying the whole Onyx folder and then going to my Houdini installation, going to the SHFS folder, into the Houdini folder and pasted this folder right there. Then everything in here should work. Now, I saved up the, to me, most exciting, but also the most difficult to explain topic for last. So this is linear regression, or a new system for linear regression inside of Houdini. And at least by the name, you can guess that this gets sort of mathy. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to jump into a whole new scene, which is actually the first scene from the first video of my ML 101 course, because this is where this node, this new node really shines. So just as a quick reminder, what we did in ML 101, we trained a neural network on the output of a wrinkle deformer. So we get wrinkles on a character, on a post character, but we get them much faster than, for example, using a vellum simulation. This works pretty much real time. And the logic behind that is, let's say we have a simpler example. Let's say we want to throw a ball and you want to record how far the ball in the end traveled. And let's say we maybe just want to vary how fast we're accelerating that ball. So we have this. 
our acceleration right here. And if we throw a ball, it travels a certain distance. And in between we have a physics simulation. So for example, also a vellum wrinkle simulation that does all the calculations for us. So we could do the same thing every time we throw a ball or for every frame or for every frame that we want to animate a character, but this gets tedious over time. So another idea would be, why not do a whole bunch of ball thrones just out front? Just throw a ton of balls and for all of them record how hard we threw them and how far they traveled. Something like this. And in the end, if we draw up a diagram where on the one axis we have the speed with which we've thrown each ball, and on the other axis we have the distance that each ball has traveled, if we are lucky we have an output like this where we can draw a very nice line between the speed and the distance. And what this in the end is, is a function. A function that if we happen to find it, we don't need a physics simulation anymore to get to the right result. In the end, now we can just take a look at what speed we've thrown a ball, then go to the intersection point on the line, and then find the distance that the ball most likely will travel. And this, in the end, is what's working in the background of our neural network muscle deformer. And this is also what we in the end call linear regression. So far, so Houdini 20.5. However, the new thing, the new interesting thing is that Houdini now is able to do linear regression just from within SOPs. We don't have to touch Python anymore. This just works on its own. So let's take a look at a simple example in here. What I did here is again our ball throw example. So again, we have in this case some random direction and some velocity. And then we have a ball that we throw into that direction and that in the end land somewhere. And what I did here is I created a data set of thrown balls. And again, this will be explained in more detail in a future video. But for now, this is a data set of a ton of different directions and velocities. And for each of those, we have the end position of the ball that we've thrown. So in the end, we have 5,000 of these examples in a data set that Houdini understands. And what I can do now is I can plug this data set into this new node, this new ML regression linear node. And this, just by hitting the display flag, has trained a model to find this function in the background to calculate the distance the ball has traveled based on its initial velocity. So what I can do now is I can take a single point, add to that point a single velocity, and what this node will spit out is the position where the ball will land in the end. And again, we can visualize all of that. And we can also tweak the velocity, in this case, just using a transform node, hopefully. And some of my view isn't working in here, but if I change the velocity or if I change the speed with which I throw the ball, this updates accordingly. And again, there was no Python involved with this at all. This was all just calculated in here using this new node. And of course, if it works for balls in here, this will also work for character animation or muscle simulations on characters. So this will make the workflow quite a lot simpler. And you can expect some updates to our ML101 course definitely in the near future. And this is it for today. This is my quick overview over all the new machine learning features inside of Houdini 21. Again, there will be other videos explaining them in more detail, going also into how to train them. But for now, it's cheers and goodbye. And as always, if you find these videos helpful and want to help us make more of them, please consider becoming a patron of ours. With big thanks going out to our existing patrons, you're the ones keeping the lights on here. Cheers, guys.